All right. Um, I think it's afternoon. It's good afternoon, and um, I'm going to try and make this uh, not too long. And uh, I'm a clinician, so I am not going to be talking a lot about research. However, anything I do talk about is uh, backed up by research somewhere. Um, so first of all, I do want to thank the, um, Vanessa and her group to have invited me here. It's really an honor, and it's fantastic to see so many people here in the celiac community. So my job is really um, to be able to talk about how to live with celiac disease right now. Um, I think we do have a future, and a future might be different than what we are doing now. Um, but what do we do? And my disclosures are not as long as theirs, but um, I am a parent of two children who have celiac disease and one who does not. And that's a lovely topic that we can have later in terms of how do you deal with that household. Um, so I think um, what I'd like to say is that everyone sitting in this room, or maybe some people sitting in this room, might be thinking, oh my god, so much information. Since this morning, we've been talking and talking and talking. What should I focus on? So the focus for this side of the room could be very different than this side of the room, or it could be very different to your next door neighbor. Some people may want to focus on um, where do I get this food? Some people may want to focus on testing. Some people may want to focus on nothing and just say, I'm here to just sit and listen. Um, but the most important thing is that this is a lifetime. So when you get a diagnosis of celiac disease, there's absolutely no way that you are going to be able to learn celiac disease in a day or expect your children, and I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist, so my focus is going to be children. So there's no way to expect your children suddenly overnight, one day they're eating that lovely pizza, and then the next day they need to eat the cardboard pizza. Don't expect that. And I have two children who have that, so I can tell you. But as, as uh, we talked about earlier and Jocelyn mentioned, once you start that project, you cannot tell your child, today eat gluten-free and tomorrow you can have something gluten. That is the wrong message because this is the treatment for them now. You would not do that if you had a child with diabetes. You wouldn't say, today you can take insulin, tomorrow don't take insulin. So this is your treatment. So once you start, you're in that one direction. However, learn about it, really learn what is a gluten-free diet, how do I live, and what is the age of my child so that you actually go based on the developmental aspects for that child. And who's going to help you? You know, parents can help, everyone can help, but the important thing is your team, and we'll talk about the team later. But the team is the one that's going to help you through this. So what are the objectives of this talk? It's really to remind everyone what is celiac disease all about and to discuss maybe some controversies, maybe clarify some of the stuff that's been talked about, and then why do we really need another treatment? For some people, maybe you need another treatment. For some people, you don't need another treatment. But I think we'll start right from where does the confusion start? So some people will say, I have celiac disease. Some people will say, I have celiac intolerance. Some people will say, I have celiacs. I hate that. Um, some people will say, I have gluten intolerance or gluten sensitivity. So gluten sensitivity, as you heard earlier, is different. Gluten sensitivity is not celiac disease. Celiac disease is celiac disease, and once you have celiac disease, you have it, whether it's, there is no, I have a little bit of celiac disease, you're not just a little pregnant. Um, so you really need to know that celiac disease is an autoimmune disease, it is not something that's an allergy, and Dr. Kirshner explained that very well earlier today, um, and it's not celiac sensitivity, uh, gluten sensitivity. Of course, we have a lot of people who talk about, you know, I have celiac disease, I'm on a gluten-free diet, but that kind of thing. So we are talking about the serious celiac disease. So this is the person where you actually have it as an autoimmune disease. And some people will say, you know, I never heard about this disease before. It must only be in the Irish or it must be in the French Canadians. Uh, I have no Irish and I have no French Canadian in my background. So it really is in any part of the world. You're not the only one who has it. It's almost one in 100 and in some populations, one in 80 children have the disease. So you're not alone. That's a good news. The bad news is there are many other people who have the disease and there are many others who have not been diagnosed as well and we all need to help with that. 
It's very common in the first degree relatives, and as you can see with the slide, the second degree relatives are not spared either. So you can tell your cousins and everyone else to get tested as well. Um, so it's an autoimmune disease, and what does that really mean? It means, again, this was discussed very nicely with, by Dr. Kirshner, is that really you have, um, you eat the gluten, it causes damage to your intestine, and then something happens in your intestine which then sends the soldiers in there and it destroys the wall and it also sort of agitates your immune system which then will cause other diseases. So that's sort of autoimmune in a very uh, basic way to explain that. It's something that does get better, the inflammation does get better, and I know you've heard a lot that it does not get better, but the majority of people in children, the inflammation does improve. Uh, but there are some where the inflammation does not improve. Um, so the question uh, again comes in, we talk about, we'll go back to this slide for a second, um, how does celiac disease happen? It did not happen because your mom ate something, I know that it didn't happen because of me, no, that's not true, uh, but it's not something you did during your pregnancy, it's not something you did any, during the delivery time, it's yes, you were born in that family, you can't change that, the genes are there, um, so we cannot change the genes. But there are many people, as we heard earlier, who have the genes and never develop the disease. So what else is going on? We heard about the microbiome. Something disrupts the microbiome. And again, microbiome is kind of hard to learn, but there's a lot of research happening in the microbiome. We do know that there are some risk factors, and I'm going to take a moment and talk about these risk factors. So again, the confusion that arises with celiac disease, a long time ago we all said the risk factors were based on washing hands or not washing hands. Those theories seem to have de been debunked a little bit. We do know that the more clean you are, the worse it is, but still that's not the only reason why you end up with celiac disease. So that risk factor has gone away. What's the current sort of theory that's there? And we discussed that in our International Celiac Conference in Paris not so long ago. The two big things that have come up from a risk factor standpoint, one is infection, and you heard that earlier as well, um, that the infections, there are many infections that are coming up as discussions. The lab in uh, the University of Chicago with Dr. Jabri is working on it. Many other people are working on many other to find out what infection it is. So wouldn't it be nice if we knew what infection, and right now you heard that we are looking at a vaccine possibly for Coxsackie virus. So if you would have that vaccine and you have those genes, maybe if that child got that vaccine, we might be able to delay or prevent the disease. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Well, we are not there yet, but there's hope, and I think that's where the research needs to happen. The second factor that has come in and to be discussed is that if you have a large amount of gluten in your diet in the first years of life, people talk about four years, five years, in the first years of life, if there's an excessive amount of gluten, that has been found to be a risk factor as well. So that's a current theory, but infections are definitely there along with the amount of food. And I think we go back again to basics. If you do an excessive amount of anything, that is really not good for anyone. So you really want to cut back on excessive of anything at all. Um, so these were different risk factors, and I'm probably not going to go through that since I probably don't have enough time. But at one time, it used to be thought, when do we feed the child? Is it if you feed a baby too early or if you feed a baby too late? So before four months, six months, if you give them gluten, that's the problem. That theory seemed to have debunked with a big uh, multi, I was an international study that was done um, that does not seem to be there. Uh, it used to be said, if you don't nurse your child and you give them gluten, that that would be a problem. Ladies don't feel guilty about it. If you didn't nurse your child, that's not what gave the uh, celiac disease. Again, that theory seemed to have debunked as well. So think in mind, if you have someone with a genetic risk, probably shouldn't feed them too much gluten in the first few years of life. Infections you cannot prevent, but infections are being looked at. And the genes that have been found to be probably more highly associated, if you want to call it, is the DQ2 homozygous. So if you're a DQ2 homozygous, if someone was to ask me, what would you do? This is my theory. If you have a D2, DQ2 homozygous child, I would probably give, I would still feed them gluten, but not an excessive amount. And if they had an infection, I probably wouldn't start gluten at that time. That's my theory, but... Um, 
it's a higher risk if you are DQ2 homozygous. It does not mean that if you're DQ2 homozygous, you are going to end up with the disease, but you're at a higher risk and you could be diagnosed early. Um, so who should be tested? So um, I used to joke uh, at Children's in Philadelphia that in my mind, everyone should be tested, but I'll be serious here. So you have the children who are symptomatic and then they are the asymptomatic high risk. So what are the symptoms? So we all talk about these classic symptoms. And when, we, when I went to medical school a long, long time ago, um, celiac disease was only tested if you had a infant or a two-year-old who had a belly sticking out and had failure to thrive, not growing well with diarrhea. That was the only child that you tested for celiac disease. But we do know that there are many other symptoms. So there are the non-GI symptoms where you can have an, a very itchy rash, which is called dermatitis herpetiformis. You can have bone disease, liver disease, iron deficiency, all those things can be associated with that. And in fact, now there's really a decline of that typical celiac with diarrhea and weight loss. You have a child usually now with more short stature or they have some thyroid, other associated diseases. So from a physician standpoint, from a clinician standpoint, pretty much if a child doesn't fit into a particular disease disorder, you should test for celiac disease. And then some children, of course, don't have any symptoms. And who are those children? There are certain genetic syndromes that are associated. There are some autoimmune diseases. And the genetic syndromes that are most commonly associated with celiac disease, type 1 diabetes, almost 10%, 15% in some cases, are associated with celiac disease. And then you see the trisomy 21 with Down syndrome. But don't forget the family members. Really, it's really important. There was a study that was done recently, came up with that there were families that were screened who had absolutely no symptoms. There were no symptoms. They, were bio they had a celiac panel, they were biopsied, and they had significant damage to their small intestine. So the symptoms do not go along. It's really important to screen the family members. What we don't know, and we really need more study, is how often should you screen the family members? So my guideline is screen everyone every year only because you can remember. You know, it's the year you can't remember, was it, did I get screened last year or the year before? So every year, and you could be cruel and screen them on their birthday, which maybe <laughs> don't do it. Um, but all family members should be screened regardless of symptoms. The thing to remember when family members are being screened, that they should be eating gluten. So so a lot of people, you know, you start on as one person gets diagnosed with celiac disease, three quarter of the people go on a gluten free diet, or the amount of gluten is reduced in the uh, in the household. So just make sure that before the blood work is done as a screen, there's enough gluten in the diet. Um, I usually will recommend in my practice that the siblings should be tested every year till they reach puberty. Do I have data, science behind that? No, but it's easy to remember. And this way you would not, forget, you know, and I usually say till puberty because I'm concerned about a child's growth. So I monitor them every year. If there are symptoms, you obviously do it sooner. Adults, you're on your own. Uh, no, I think the adults, again, if you do check cholesterol, then maybe that's when you add a celiac panel. If you have symptoms, don't ignore them. So this is probably one of my most favorite slides as I am teaching the children, as I see them in clinic. Why do you need to be diagnosed and treated with celiac disease? It's not for that bellyache. It's not for that vomiting. It is in a way, but really not. It's to improve your intestinal healing. So you want to heal that intestine and you want to decrease the autoimmune risk in the future. So those are the reasons why you want your child to stay on a gluten-free diet. And it's really important to teach the teenagers especially, especially if someone is being screened for short stature and your son or daughter says, oh, I'm, I'm 21 now. Why do I care? I'm not going to grow anymore. So why shouldn't I eat gluten now? So it's important to remember that. Um, so how do we t uh, really go about with diagnosis? So there are blood tests, um, there's stool and urine, and I'm not going to discuss that. That has been discussed earlier. And then there's the endoscopy. So which are the blood tests that can be done? Um, there are many blood tests. Just as a basic to remember, the first thing you want to look at is someone's total IgA or serum IgA level. That's an internal control. If someone's serum IgA level is low, then discuss with your practitioner. There are different kinds of antibodies that need to be done. As a rule, if your IgA level is normal, 
What is recommended is the tissue transglutaminase. That is, if you look at all the guidelines, it says the tissue transglutaminase needs to be tested. Those of us who are really practicing celiac, celiacologists, I guess that could be a new term. <laughs> Those of us who practice seeing care of, taking care of children with celiac disease, we do believe that besides the tissue transglutaminase, you should do a deamidated gliadin as well. So it's really important to remember that. And you know, if your primary doctor is arguing, then come back to the team here and they'll discuss with them. But the tissue transglutaminase and the deamidated IgG should be looked at, and it's all blood tests. These are the tests that should be done as a screen screening test. They should be done so long as you're eating gluten. These are also the tests that are done to follow up over time when you're on a gluten-free diet. So you're on a gluten-free diet, how do you know that you are doing a good job, especially those people who don't have any symptoms? And you're not going to get an endoscopy every month, so what are you going to do? You're going to get blood tests done. And it's really important that when you're looking at the blood test, let's say the first blood test is done three months into the diagnosis, don't freak out if that blood test is still abnormal. Those antibodies are still going to be abnormal. What you want to see is a gradual reduction in that. You don't want to see that it's going down and then it climbs up because then you have to investigate what's happening, but you want to see a gradual reduction. You are not going to get a normal panel in three months in the majority of people, so please do not freak out. Don't blame your teenage son or daughter that they're eating gluten behind their backs. They are not. The second thing to remember is that the labs in this country uh, have different norms. So Quest does a different, LabCorp does a different, uh, I'm sure here it's something different. So try and keep to the same lab each time for comparison. So you cannot compare apples to oranges. So look at that, work with your team, and they'll be able to help you decipher what those labs mean. But the labs should just be going down. Please do not freak out. This is just an example of the lab results, and you can see even a couple years later, there are some abnormalities there. So long as numbers are going down, you're in a good place. Um, so besides doing a celiac panel, what are the labs that are done? Again, there are some guidelines, and then there's some personal preferences that people do. So everyone agrees in the world of celiac disease and caretaking is that you follow with the celiac serology. You do a CBC, you look at an iron, you look at liver, you look at thyroid. You're not doing a thyroid panel every three months. You're doing that one time and then you're monitoring over time. Vitamin D is a lovely one. Everyone likes to know about vitamin D and if it's low, it should be supplemented. Um, these are recommendations. These are things that are done. They're not done every single time, but at least once the panel is normal, your serology is normal, once a year you should be doing these labs. So you should be following up with your team and not just you know, sort of saying, well, I'm feeling fine. I don't need to do anything. It's really important to follow up with them. Hepatitis B surface antibody is one, again, um, it's the same toaster theory that will need to be debunked at some point, um, that we all say that if all the babies get hepatitis B immunization. Everyone does. We also know that there are people who don't have celiac disease and you, they lose the efficacy of the vaccine over time. It's said that people with celiac disease, there's a higher failure rate, so we check hepatitis B surface antibody because that's what we've been taught, and we do that, and if it's negative, then we go ahead and suggest reimmunization. What we don't know is when should you really do this? Should you do this when the child starts a gluten-free diet? Should you do this when they are waiting till teenagers? So everyone sort of does it whenever. I personally will absolutely always do it, at least in the teenager. Um, but it's something that is tested. And then as you meet the dietitian, if they feel like nutritionally you're not complete, then there are nutritional labs that are done as well. Um, so the genetic testing, and this was discussed earlier as well, just because you have the HLA does not mean you have celiac disease. I totally agree with Benny that a genetic testing should not be the screening test. There are so many children who are placed on a gluten-free diet just because they are HLA DQ2 or DQ8 positive. 30 to 40 percent will never ever develop the disease. So don't put them on a gluten-free diet and then have to go through the trials and tribulations of challenges. Um, then we talk about endoscopy. Of course, as gastroenterologists, we all talk about endoscopies. And just for everyone to know, the take home from this slide is that the endoscopy can look normal. So when the endoscopy is done and the endoscopist comes out and tells you, oh, everything looked normal, 
Don't have your hopes too high. It's the biopsies that you wait, want to wait for. So visual can look normal in children or it can look abnormal. And also, we don't all agree with should an endoscopy be done or not. Or I should say most of us say that an endoscopy should be done, but there are uh, other guidelines from Europe where endoscopies are not recommended if you have high numbers, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But biopsies have to be done. So just the visual is not enough. The biopsies are important. Uh, going back to the biopsies, one of the things that you'll find, and that's coming up as a point of discussion, is there are children who have a positive serology, meaning their serology is abnormal and the biopsies are normal. That subset you have to sit down and discuss with your team. That is not a cut and dry go on a gluten-free diet. There are there are studies done to look at those that group where a positive serology, a negative biopsy, one third of them may never develop celiac disease. So it's really important to have that discussion with your primary team in terms of how do you approach that. So these are the guidelines from the Europeans who are sort of talking about not doing biopsies. Initially it was if you're symptomatic, and you have a TTG that's greater than 10 times, you have a positive endomyceal, you don't do a biopsy. The most recent ones, you don't even need symptoms. If your TTG is that high, you can go on a gluten-free diet and be called celiac. I don't think that uh, the North American pediatricians are there, and a number of us believe that that is not something that we want to do right now, because you're doing an endoscopy not just to look for celiac disease, you're doing an endoscopy to look for other reasons of that bellyache, to look for other reasons for not growing or uh, anemia and those kind of things. So again, it's a discussion with your team that needs to come. It needs to be a discussion with the family and with your team. So what should be done after diagnosis? So you had a positive serology, you had a positive biopsy, um, you should be called. Someone should tell you that you have celiac disease and explain somewhat on the phone what it is, and then you need a visit with your team. The education in that first visit is so important. It is critical to the future of your child that that education happen, and then you start the gluten-free diet. So who's your team? Every hospital has different people. Um, I think the most important person in this team is the dietitian and the educator. It is really important that you follow them up on a regular basis. It's not a one time. You cannot learn this in one visit. It just is not possible. So it's really important to have that first detailed visit and then follow up with them. The second person who's important in this team is the psychologist. And that is, again, key to this. It's not because you don't know what to do. It's overwhelming. It is overwhelming to be in a family that has children with celiac disease or a parent with celiac disease, but more so children. So the psychologist is needed to really teach you how to cope with this disease as a parent and how to cope with it as a child. So the psychologist is the second person. And then it's the gastroenterologist and everyone else. And your family and friends should be at some of these visits so they can learn with you as well. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on what's the treatment. We all know what the treatment is. It's currently, it's a gluten-free diet. And you've heard lots of things about this gluten-free diet. It has to be very strict. It's a lifelong diet. And the majority is you need to avoid wheat, rye, and barley. Oats are in a gray, and that's Jocelyn saying it should be in gray because there are some people who feel like oats shouldn't be there, and some people say it should be there. We all agree if you're going to do oats, it's gluten-free oats. So this is the gluten-free diet, right? These are all the f uh, grains that contain gluten, and you all know that, and we all need to avoid this. And these are some other things that we don't think about it, but again, they all contain gluten. So, you know, it gets overwhelming if you have to remember these lists. These are all the things that I cannot do, I cannot do, I cannot do. Is there another choice? And I think that's really where we come to where is the future going. We know what a gluten-free diet is. We've learned a gluten-free diet. We kind of know how to live with it. But wouldn't it be nice if there was another choice? And again, it's not for everyone. There are some people who would say, absolutely, I'm not going to do a medicine. However, it would be nice to have that choice to say yes or no. I'm going to do it or I'm not going to do it. Right now, we absolutely have no choice uh, of anything else. But do we want anything else? I think majority of people would say, yeah, it would be nice to have a choice. And then I can decide whether I want it or not. And that's really where 
we would like to get rid of this label reading. You know, we read labels, we read labels. You used to do shopping that I know I can tell you when I um, uh, started off on the journey with my children about 15 years ago, I can tell you one instance I had a meltdown in Whole Foods uh, where I knew my shopping before used to be in 15, 20 minutes. I hate spending time there and now my shopping would take me about an hour and a half or two. And I knew in this Whole Foods where the pretzels were. I had to go somewhere, drop these pretzels off for my son. I go walking up, and they changed it. I'm looking at that aisle and saying, what happened? There were pretzels here on this thing. Where are the pretzels? And it's only pretzels, right? No big deal, but a huge, huge deal. Those pretzels were not there. My son is waiting for the pretzels. I have five minutes. I think they would have called the cops on me. I went up and I said, pretzels, I need my pretzels. So wouldn't it be nice if we had something else? And here we are, you know. Then someone brings you food and says it's gluten-free. But you forgot the other things. So wouldn't it be nice if we could have something else? What else is wrong with the gluten-free diet? If we had a choice, what else is wrong? There are nutritional deficiencies. There's lots of studies done that if you are eating a commercially prepared gluten-free diet, high in a lot of sugars, high fructose, that's why a lot of people who go on a gluten-free diet end up with belly aches. It's that fructose in there. There's a lot of fat, the calories are not there, and even if they are there, then you gain a lot of weight, so then a lot of people don't want to eat those foods, so you're nutritionally totally incomplete. It is not easy. You heard earlier from the lawyer as well, this social exclusion. Not easy. If you, can, if you just think about it, it's your child who's sitting in that one little table that the lawyer had shown us. It is sad. We are ready to cry about that because that is the basis of life is food. And if you cannot give food to your children, you feel as a parent that you failed them. And there is a lot of guilt there. There is so much guilt on the child's side and so much guilt on the parent's side and the grandparents, let me not forget them. Very expensive, extremely expensive. You know, a loaf of bread that maybe you could get for a dollar, you don't get it for more than four to six, less than four to six dollars. And we heard from everyone that you cannot achieve a totally gluten-free diet. Even if you are so careful, unless you're preparing everything from scratch and you're holding your child hostage in your home. And that is not okay. That is not okay. It is not okay for you as a parent. It's not okay for, for the child. So that's where we really, really want something else as a choice. Let's figure it out for ourselves, whether we'll do it or not. There is so much fear. Everyone is fearful. This is why we need the psychologist. We don't want our children to be this, that I can't eat anything, I'll just starve because there's nothing there. Let us get that choice and then let us make that decision. So how can we really do that? We need to work with our friends who are doing all these medications and trials and work with them in terms of funding some of these studies, getting them of that stuff done, and this is the final slide, this is not so easy to get those drugs. And I can tell you that when Immusan T with the vaccine was a failure in a way, maybe, I was depressed because I used to tell everyone, oh, the medicine's around the corner, medicine's around the corner, medicine's around... There was a medicine around the corner and it didn't happen. So don't give up hope. It's not that the medicine is going to be for everyone, but you've then got a choice. We all need choices. Thank you.